A few months ago, in an effort to enhance my video production, I decided to construct this camera arm. Given the limited space in my shop, I require some ceiling rails with a dolly that I could move along my mill, my lathe, or my workbench. The process of custom building this joint showcased the versatility of my fourth axis. I was able to machine all sides of the part with a single clamp simply by rotating it. But in terms of fourth axis work holding, a setup like this, or like this, is much more appropriate. Hence, in this video, we'll be crafting a faceplate that accommodates both of these setups. Let's start by removing the current faceplate and the cycloidal drive in order to get some dimensions. Following repeated challenges with the backlash of a worm gear rotary table, I found myself contemplating more and more about obtaining a cycloidal drive. But I was not yet ready to live just with a single kidney. Fortunately, after about two years of searching, I found this cycloidal drive from a KUKA robot. In this animation, you can see the working principle and the internals of this masterpiece. Among all its components, it had an O-ring ceiling that was oil leaking, and the maintenance protocol said it needed to be replaced. I was lucky enough to get a good deal for it and still be able to keep both my kidneys. When I built the initial plate, I thought that having lots of threaded holes will add more versatility. Unfortunately, they just collect more swarf. Therefore, the new faceplate will be much simpler, with just two features. It should be able to hold a vise and a front-mounted 3 jar chuck. I'm gonna use this chunk of chrome molly for the new faceplate. It's a bit thicker than my need, so let's make some chips. For now, I'll use the default 3 jar chuck. With just three points of contact, I can be sure that the grip is equally distributed. So, let's switch to the outer jaws. The jaws are numbered, and each of them must go into their slot in an ascending order, so that they close properly. This chunk is quite heavy, definitely the biggest chunk of metal I've machined on this lathe, so I'm a bit nervous. It might not be the case, but with a few light mallet blows and some extra tightening, I'm trying to get back my peace of mind. The bandsaw cut was not that straight, so I need to take a few cuts in order to get a clean face. Maybe it's just my beginner anxiety, but when I have to deal with a big chunk like this, I feel more comfortable machining it in manual mode. So I'll take advantage of the manual feature of this lathe. I'm trying to clean the OD while reducing the diameter as less as possible. The stock has roughly 160mm so I don't have much wiggle room. With a few light passes I was able to get a clean surface around 158mm. In order to make room for the cycloidal drive I need to remove some material from the front of the part. Usually this is a job for a three panning tool but I don't have a tripanning tool and I was too lazy to build one just for this project. So I'll try to use what I have. In this case a cutter with a straight VCMT insert and some hand cranking should do the job. With the VCMT tool I was not able to get clean corners, but that can be easily fixed with the boring bar. If the scrapeyards are my Disneyland then the flea markets are my church. When I saw this solid carbide shank boring bar and the price was just $30, I handed the money and I disappeared quickly. The price of one of these bought new is at least 6-7 times more, 
So finding this really made my day. Now the middle island. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? What if I go past center and reverse the spindle? I thought I could get up easily with this by going maximum towards X minus and reverse the spindle direction. But the resulting diameter is smaller than my X minus travel. Guess that's one of the downsides of having a solid tool post. So back to the same tool I use for roughing the face. This feature is very important because this will ensure the concentricity with the cycloidal drive. Here I'm aiming for a 42mm diameter, preferably on the plus side of tolerance spectrum. This island needs to be shorter so that it fits into the middle of cycloidal drive. And with the chamfer function, let's distinguish ourselves from the animals. I also need to make a small pocket and this will be a great job for another good catch that I got. But first, I need a spot drill and an 8mm drill to make enough space for the microboring bar. This microboring bar and its holder was also a good deal that I got at the flea market. This is one of the examples where having a manual lace with CNC capabilities really pays off. When working in manual mode and repetitive tasks, the risk of messing something up grows exponentially. With this carbide microboring bar, any small mistake would have ruined the part or the boring bar. Fortunately, I just told my custom Linux CNC the final dimensions and the depth of cut, and everything else happened like magic. Now that all operations are done on the back side of the part, I'll swap the 3 jar chuck with the new 6 jar chuck. Now I need more points of contact. You might have thought that I was gonna clamp this from the outer diameter, but the island in the middle will determine the concentricity with the cycloidal drive, so I want that as a reference surface when machining the front part. Of course, I was curious about the concentricity. And I'm really pleased with the result. Now that the part is a bit lighter and I have 6 points of contact, I can use one of the features of this lathe that I really like. With some extra coding I was able to obtain constant surface speed when using the lathe in manual mode. Therefore you can hear that the spindle is accelerating as you get closer to the center in order to keep the surface speed constant. Of course, there's a maximum limit set so that I don't take off. With all the enthusiasm, I forgot that I have one last step to do, so I need to reverse the jaws in order to reclaim the other side of the part. Fortunately, there is nothing critical. I need to machine a shoulder that allows me to fit the faceplate into the existing Fort Axis body. According to CAD, the opening is 155mm in diameter, but unfortunately my caliper is not that big, so I am doing kind of a guesswork here. Let's not forget about chamfers. I really love this ability to cut chamfers without having to change the tool. With this nice finish we can call the lathe work complete, so let's move to the mill. Ever since I started growing my shop I discovered that the nicest gifts are the one you make to yourself. This vice is about 3 years old and it was a birthday present to myself. I like it that it has a very large gripping range and removable jaws. This makes it very versatile, allowing me to make custom jaws perfectly adapted for the job. A quick stoning ensures that there are no burrs that can affect the precision. This set of jaws was designed to safely hold a 160mm chuck. I often relax by scrolling on machinery auction sites and sometimes some offer catch my eye. This chuck along with three others was part of an auction that I won. It got my attention the fact that it's mounted with front screws so this made it the perfect candidate for my fourth axis. Compared to the regular scroll chuck, this is a wedge chuck. You can see in this animation how these work internally. The mechanism produces almost double the gripping force compared to a standard scroll chuck. 
and a higher concentricity, at least for the new ones. That vertical pin that sticks out from the face tells me that the jaws are not engaged yet, so on a late it's not safe to spin yet. Notice how the teeth of the jaw are angled. When the chuck is tightened, the angled teeth inside the chuck will engage with those on the jaw, acting like a wedge. The pin that lowers down indicates that there's full engagement, but if I go too much, the pin sticks out again. When gripping something, the jaws must be extended wide enough so that when you tighten the jaws, the pin should be flush with the surface of the chuck. At the first attempt this wasn't the case, so I had to move the jaws out by one tooth and try again. Now we're good. Just a few mallet blows required by my OCD. Before I do any milling, it's important to make sure that the workpiece is perfectly leveled. Otherwise, any potential errors would be transferred into the features that I'm about to machine. On the x-axis it looks fine, but on the y-axis... Damn, there's way too much. I have almost 800 of a millimeter difference back to front. That's a lot for what I'm trying to achieve here. My old friend, the rubber mallet, only seems to move the problem from y-axis to the x-axis. It's the first time I use this chuck in a setup like this, I'm not sure what the issue is. Perhaps it's not properly sitting into the custom jaw, perhaps there is an issue with the chuck. However, let's go with the already tested solution, I'll debug this later. This whole scroll chuck was precise so far, so hopefully it will be this time too. And yes, with less than 100 of a millimeter overall, we can call this good to go. Before I start the machining, I need to tell the controller where my part is located in the 3D space. This touch probe, along with some routines in Linux CNC, will do that for me. What I need to do is select the appropriate probing routine and specify the approximate diameter for the circle to be probed. With the probe being positioned approximately to the center of the circle, the probing can begin. The nice part of having custom software is that I can tell the machine what to do. In this case, when I unplug the probe, it's obviously that I'm gonna remove it, so the Z head automatically lifts up. It's time for some spot drilling. Another useful feature that I have on this mill is the tool length probe. This will automatically set the tool length offset of a tool in Linux CNC. With the feature hole spotted, I can now proceed with drilling the holes for the mounting screws. Then the hole for the trigger chuck, then the hole of the pins that will constrain the vise. This 6mm end mill will do the counter bore for the head screws. Luckily these are not blind holes, so the chips can fall down. Otherwise cutting these deep small diameter bores without flat coolant will lead to serious chips recutting and maybe even tool breakage. That's why I try to blow up chips with the fog buster. While mathematics is a common subject in school, its practicality often goes unnoticed. As a software developer, witnessing adaptive toolpaths in action makes me appreciate the intricate mathematics and algorithms behind the machine's seemingly magical movements. See those marks? Even if I can barely feel them to the touch, they cannot remain like that. Not when I have a surface grinder waiting to beautify this part. But for that, I need a few hundred millimeter deep groove so that the grinder wheel has a place to exit. 3mm end mill is the right tool for the job. Here I'm about to realize the importance of that truss but measure. I've modeled the part in Fusion using the cut of the vise. But I never actually measured the vise. In cut the vise is 82mm and my pocket is 82.01. It should be dead on but I've actually measured the vise and I found out that it's 81.96. That difference, that's just the thickness of a human hair, translates into that plate that you've just heard. The perfectionist in me wonders if I should scrap this part and start over, but that would mean another few days until I get a new chunk of material and since I'm already here, let's add some chamfers. I don't know if it's just me, but I always have an anxiety when I need to tap blind holes. 
Probably is because of my lack of experience, but a broken tap at this stage might fully compromise the entire part. With just a 2 horsepower spindle motor, I can't rig it up holes this big, at least not in steel. And when I tap by hand, especially with these spiral taps, I end up even controlling my breath, just not to mess up anything. I definitely need a tap follower for my mill. I must add this project on my short list. Fortunately, I was lucky this time and all needed holes are threaded. Now I can start breathing normally. I was about to get hypoxia. I was so impatient to get to the point where I see the vise mounted that only now I can think on how to actually clamp the vise onto this plate. I am aiming for some clamps that are covering completely all the exposed holes. The other personality of mine that's always happy to cut corners thought it would be too much of a burden to spot drill these holes first. I would not be angry on this if I didn't knew I should do it that way. So yes, at the advantage of saving a minute, the drill tip walked a bit and the holes are not exactly on the spot. That rubbing you hear when the drill re-enters the hole after a retract is the proof for this. It's time for some more tapping breath work. <sighs> With the clamping hole drills and tapped, I had another chance to screw this up. That's how desperation sounds like in Romanian. Due to my laziness, in Fusion I copied the cam settings for already existing holes, but I forgot to change the diameters to actually match the diameters of these holes. This was the last step for this part. And this is how easy you can mess it up exactly at the last step. If this was a customer part, the material and all the effort so far would have been wasted. But since the functionality is not affected in any way, I'll just have to deal with my ego bruises. I still need to chamfer the mounting holes, but after this experience I don't want to risk anything. It's safer to grind this a bit until it fits. Nice and easy, no need to rush now. At least, now I have a tool that I can use to add chamfers on 10mm counterbores. Before I make the clamps, I needed to call this complete by adding some chamfers on the backside. Building this project ended up taking more time than I anticipated. Primarily because of certain external factors related to the heat treatment process. In the upcoming video, we will focus on creating the clamps and doing some surface grinding. Once the part returns from plasma nitriding and hot bluing, we'll assemble everything and conduct some test cuts. Thanks for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.